good evening, everyone. I'm Sandy Treadway, the director of the Library of Virginia, and on behalf of all of us here at the library, it's wonderful to see you tonight. August can sometimes be a slow month. You never quite know um, where people are, but school is starting to get back. I know that VCU particularly was closing up the, the roads this morning, so <laughs> I know that people are starting to think about um, about fall, and I'm uh, glad to see that, that you're all here and not on vacation. Um, and I'm just curious, how many of you, for, for how many of you is this your first visit to the library of Virginia? Well, great. That means there's a lot of friends and family in the audience, uh, which is terrific. But for those of you who haven't been here before, um, I hope you'll come back sometime during the day when our reading rooms are open and take advantage of some of the wonderful resources we have here um, that, are, that are yours to use um, at any time. Uh, and for any purpose. We're very proud this evening to partner with the Future of Richmond's Past and uh, our media sponsor, the Richmond Times Dispatch, in bringing you this event. And we thank both of those organizations for their ongoing support of programs like this that help us fulfill our mission of sharing and exploring Virginia's history and culture. You may have noticed on some of the chairs that there are some cards asking you um, about how you learned uh, about this evening's program. That helps us with our marketing efforts, so if you have a pencil and, and don't mind taking a moment to jot that down, and if you'd like to add your contact information, we'll be sure you learn about future programs here at the <coughs> library. You can just leave them on, on the table as you leave. Before we begin tonight's program, I just want to tell you about some exciting events that are coming up in the not too distant future. Um, our next public program will take place on Friday, September 6th um, as part of Richmond's First Fridays series. We're going to have John Del Rey and Kelly Macklin who are recognized master shape note singers. Um, and and uh, they've been recognized by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities as really practicing the, uh, the high form of that art. They're going to be here to talk about what shape note singing is and I think to kind of teach the audience how to do it. Um, so we certainly invite you to join us for that. And then on Thursday, September 12th, we will be helping a local writer, Ann Westrick, launch her new young adult novel, which has already got some buzz around town. It's called Brotherhood, and it's set in Virginia right after the Civil War in 1867. And there'll be a reception before that um, book launch. And if you haven't already, please come back and check out our two exhibits that are off the lobby. Um, the Importance of Being Cute, which has to do with Virginians and their pets over time, which is a wonderful exhibit. And then uh, The Dark Side, Night Photography in Virginia. Um, and those images are absolutely breathtaking. So I do encourage you to come back for that. I was told to add, though, don't come over Labor Day weekend because we're close that Saturday and that Monday. But any other time, Monday through Saturday, um, please do. Back. Now tonight's discussion is a perfect example of why we study history. Several months ago we were approached by Black Dog and Leventhal, publishers of a new book that takes about 100 articles from the New York Times um, blog that's been developed, a blog called Disunion, um, to promote conversation and exploration of issues related to the American Civil War. Since its debut in 2010, uh, that website and that blog have published more than 400 articles and maintained an ongoing forum for discussion about the issues that the articles raise. So we're commemorating the publication of that book, um, Disunion, tonight by hosting a conversation about why the Civil War remains a touchstone for understanding the world we live in today. In many ways, the Civil War is as important in defining who we are as Americans as the Revolutionary Era was, and there'd be many people that would argue it's much more important. To help us understand how we choose to remember the war and its legacy, we've convened a panel of men and women who interact directly with the public on an ongoing basis on topics relating to the Civil War. Tonight, you'll be hearing from Ranger Ed Sanders, who coordinates the interpretive programming for the Richmond National Battlefield Park, which is a group of 13 battlefield sites and four interpretive centers that are administered here in town by the National Park Service. We're also pleased to be joined by Dr. Warnett Lee, who's curator of African American history at the Virginia Historical Society. 
and Mr. Robert Moore, a proud native um, of the Virginia Shenandoah Valley, who maintains San Angela, and I probably messed that up, a blog, a website devoted to encouraging spirited conversation about the Civil War. And I'm also delighted that we have with us tonight Mr. Clay Risen, who is the op-ed staff editor at the New York Times, and he's the one who helps to maintain and develop uh, the Disunion website. And holding this group of folks together and <laughs> stimulating them to share their um, experiences with you um, is none other than uh, our own University of Richmond president, Dr. Edward Ayers. Now, I know everyone in tonight's audience is well familiar with Ed's contributions to the field of Civil War history and his passion for making sense of this most complex time in our nation's history. He's the author of several award-winning books, the pathbreaking founder of, or the founder of the pathbreaking, I should say, you probably have been covered too, of the online Valley of the Shadow project. He's a radio personality um, as one of the hosts of the marvelous Backstory um, history program that's heard locally on NPR. And he is the recipient of one of this year's uh, National Humanities Medals presented by President Barack Obama just a few weeks ago in celebration of Ed's commitment to broadening citizen engagement with the humanities. I want to thank all of our panelists as well as our audience for being here tonight. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ed to launch our program. Great to see everybody tonight, and even if you're seated, seated just slightly off balance, we'll, we'll slide on down that way. But, uh, if, uh, and it, as Sandy said, uh, here in August, we were hoping for a good turnout, and here you are. So we're, and we'll, we'll, we'll hope to reward uh, your loyalty with uh, an exciting discussion tonight. So I'm actually going to throw things off balance a little bit more by, instead of having uh, everybody come up at once, I'm actually going to have Clay come up and tell us about the Disunion blog. I wonder how many people have looked at the Disunion blog at the New York Times. Good. I would say that's about half. So Clay, that gives you a sense of the, the most difficult possible <laughs> situation that half people see and half have. Um, and, um, and, and, and perhaps you can say something about the book uh, as well. And then the rest of us will come up and we'll talk about what it's like to translate history every day. And so Clay will come on up and then give us a demo. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Sandy. It is uh, really an honor to be here tonight. Uh, we launched this project with uh, basically on the sesquicentennial of Lincoln's election and uh, never really imagined that it would be as successful as it has been uh, with a book out, with uh, several awards that the series has won, and uh, panel discussions and events like this all up and down the East Coast. Uh, what's most gratifying about it is that it has shown it has sort of proven the premise that we began with, which was you could take a historical event or a you know, five years worth of events, uh, the Civil War, and uh, particularly a topic that I think for a lot of Americans is either not really well understood or sort of assumed to be fully in the past, right? Something that we kind of know everything about and don't need to talk about anymore. Uh, not everyone feels that way, but I think uh, for a lot of people, <laughs> obviously some people disagree with that premise uh, strongly. But our feeling was that if we got a good mix of people, if we got a presentation that was engaging and, uh, and varied, that we could get a lot of those people who might uh, not give a lot of thought to the Civil War to start to look at it in a different way. And in doing so, get them to think about American history as something that is not simply in the past, but is uh, an ongoing conversation. And so what we did was we said, well, let's get, uh, let's start to identify some of the young scholars who are out there, people who are doing interesting work in parts of the Civil War history that maybe are not as well <coughs> understood. Uh, let's also get people who are not historians, who are lay people who happen to be experts in one area or the other, uh, people who are high school teachers or uh, you know retired uh, military folks who uh, you know are just really. Uh, it's been uh, to be perfectly honest, it's been amazing the wide range of people who have come to us or that we've been able to, 
to identify as authors. So uh, I'm not going to run through this too much, but it gives you know basically the idea is every couple of days we post an article, uh, an original article written by one of our authors or one written by an author uh, that uh, that focuses on a story or a theme that is loosely related to this point in the sesquicentennial. So right now, uh, as you can see, this is uh, an article by Louis Mazur, who is a professor at Rutgers, uh, that is about the Lincoln's response to James Conkling's uh, request uh, to come uh, speak at uh, uh, speak in Springfield. And uh, that happened on August 14th. We have another article up here about the Lawrence Massacre, uh, which took place in, uh, uh, out in, in Kansas. Uh, it was a horrible guerrilla warfare uh, episode on April 20th. Um, or actually not April 20th, I'm sorry, that's the day of the letter. Uh, it actually happened in August of 1863. So this is, this is kind of the premise of the series, and then we allow people to discuss it and discuss each article in comments and and then we also have a Facebook page and we do events like this and like I said what's been particularly uh, particularly warming and, and uh, surprising to me is is the level of conversation uh, we were worried to some extent that we would get either one of two responses we'd either get you know, all the crazies come out uh, no offense if there's any <laughs> But you know who I'm talking about. Uh, or, or we would get nothing at all. Uh, which is kind of partly why we called it disunion, because we figured, well, we could run it for six months, and if we start in November of, uh, November of 2010, then we would go six months, and that gets us the anniversary of Fort Sumter. And if no one's reading it, we'll just stop it, and we'll say, well, it was all about disunion. It's just about the dissolution of the country. That's, it wasn't about the war at all. Uh, but it's a nice title for uh, a series about the war in general, so that would be something we could go with, and, and six months into it, we realized we had something bigger than we had ever imagined we would have, and so we, we stuck with the title. But that's really been uh, the response, and, and uh, across the board, the conversation has been rich, it's been varied, it's been uh, you know, people coming from different ages, from different parts of the country, our readership, and we can track it. Uh, because this is uh, a website, you can see where people come from, and it's uh, not just New York or not just the South, it's parts of the West Coast, it's parts of the Midwest, it's, uh, we have a huge readership in England, we have uh, a lot of readers in Japan, uh, people who are just very interested in the topic, and I, I'd like to think that it is not simply because you know, it's the New York Times or simply because it's uh, you know, something to read in the morning, but it's the, the people who are doing the writing and the people who are really coming to us with the topics and saying, you know, we need to do a piece about the Lawrence Massacre, we need to uh, frame it this way, and, and presenting it in a fresh, interesting way that gets people to start to talk. And uh, hopefully that is, uh, that's kind of what we'll do with this evening uh, as well. So uh, I guess I'll turn it back to Ed at this point, who will introduce the rest of us, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you very much. Understanding that we have uh, two authors who are in the book tonight. Is that right? Could you please introduce, introduce yourselves? Uh, we actually have more. Right. What? Right. Stand up and tell us who you are. Oh, look at this. This is great. But so John, maybe you can start. Tell us who you are and what you wrote. Uh, John Tomaski. I wrote a piece in May on the adoption of the Second National Flag of the Confederacy. Right. Several pieces, including one on underwear. <laughs> one, one of our most popular pieces, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I go from the underwear to the death of Stonewall Jackson. Ben Clary, I wrote uh, one piece on Jim Stewart's ride around the closet, and three pieces about uh, Jackson. Right. Elizabeth Pryor, I wrote um, an article about these uh, decision to go to the South. Right. I'm John Brady, and I did several <coughs> articles, and for this audience, it was Richmond Fred Riot, um, and as well as Matthew Fontaine Moore's How You Do My Warfare. Wow! 
you had this many offers? And no, this is this is wonderful, and of course you yourself. I did. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. If this is slightly un unorthodox. I'm going to use my authority here to see if, and we're going to have a lot of conversation. So let's just just so you'll know that we'll be looking for questions and answers for everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm tempted to ask Clay more questions about the shooting blog, but I, I'm, I'm just itching to get everybody else involved in the conversation, if that's okay. okay. I'm sure will, and about the, the book itself. And the book's doing well, too? It's, it's doing very well, yeah. yeah. yeah both, the, uh, well the, both the print version and there's also a, a Kindle e-version, and uh, those are both, both doing very well. Which sells more now? You know, it's funny, um, I haven't looked at the most recent numbers, but for this, uh, the Kindle is, is they're, just, they're about 50-50. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of the things we want to talk about tonight, is what difference does it make to that we're doing history in this format now. You know, this something would have been impossible, uh, maybe even five years ago, to have had a, a blog like this, um, and to have it this sort of reach that you can, and it's participatory both in authorship, but also in readership. So, that's part of the impetus tonight is that all of us up here are doing history in different ways and trying to wrestle with a, a different kinds of talking with an audience about a subject that's off, often volatile. So my first question is I want to, as a sort of additional form of introduction, ask people down the table, what do you do each day with history? <laughs> and we'll start with Lauren as so she's looking into disbelief. <laughs> so good to be with you all. Thank you so no much. No candor, and just answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a and a Virginian. <laughs> so hospitality is our thing. Very important. <laughs> I am at the Virginia Historical Society and have been there 12 years. And I'm very pleased to be one of the people involved in launching Unknown No Longer, a database of Virginia slave names. And because Virginia was the largest slaveholding state, um, and the Virginia Historical Society has been the repository of elite um, family records. I have a cornucopia of records to go through. And I'm extracting the names of enslaved people and putting them in a format so that genealogists and researchers can find their ancestors. Okay. 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 I guess I'm going to start being nice because people are really <laughs> Um, my name is Ed Sanders, and it is also a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Um, I am a supervisory park ranger at Richmond National Battlefield Park, and it is my job daily to uh, op help operate the park, uh, meet the visitors, uh, prepare programs to tell the stories of uh, battles and campaigns fought around Richmond, um, do interpretive websites that uh, for people who head out to the battlefield, can take a look and see the landscape and read the sign and get a better understanding of what took place there. Um, so a little bit of everything uh, with the public, uh, from operating visitor centers to doing programs to uh, supervising others who do those things as well. My name is Robert Moore, and so I'm going to be here as well, and uh, Sam Reed from the Shenandoah Valley, pretty much rode down this afternoon. Uh, I run San Antonio's blog, and I've been doing so for about five years now. And the objective there is to uh, uh, bring up topics that are uh, that challenge our contemporary memory or the lingering memory of the Civil War, uh, especially as far as the Southern Unionism, Unionism goes. Uh, <coughs> the Shenandoah Valley is probably best known for the uh, Stonewall Jackson, uh, the Stonewall Brigade, but there's a lot more to it, uh, including Southern Unionism and USCTs that came out of the Shenandoah Valley. I'm glad maybe you would say, I'd be curious to know sort of the origins of the, of the blog and you know, any challenges that you faced with it along the way. Well, it, it began really with uh, uh, early 2010, a conversation where we were looking, we being the, the op-ed page at the New York Times where I hang my hat uh, <laughs> otherwise. And uh, it was really a conversation about what are some new ways that we can use the web platform that we had, uh, and a lot of us sort of wanted to do something with history uh, that was built around, uh, with history, but was built around argumentation and uh, individual authors, and we said, well, you know, 
sesquicentennial is coming up, what, why don't we do uh, a project where people basically write, you know, the historical equivalent of an op-ed, you know, a thousand words or so, uh, with an argument, with uh, exposition, you know, something that's really aimed at the uh, general public. Uh, and we'll do one of those every couple of days and uh, just throw it out there and see what people think. And uh, that was really the genesis. And then from there, it was playing with that. And well, we could do things around art, we could do things around audio, we could do all sorts of things with that. But it was a fairly basic premise. Uh, was underwear a part of the vision? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, not to, not to take the serious, play the serious man, but I mean, in, in a way, yeah, because part of our uh, part of our approach was let's tell the cultural element of the Civil War. Let's look at what the lived experience of everybody involved in the war was. So we made a, an effort to you know, try to tell some of the stories of you know, freedmen, of of, you know, of African Americans in the North, but obviously also of slaves, uh, also of uh, the Native American experience, of the immigrant experience, of all of these things that we can do because we have so much, you know, we, we can do one of these almost every day. And, uh, and the readership is there, and uh, so it's really been a great, uh, it, that actually has been the challenge, is, is molding all of the stuff that we have. I mean, we have so much great writing and so much great material, and uh, deciding what goes where and how do you tell narratives through the course of several pieces by several authors one of the reasons we did the book was because we wanted to distill it down to uh, some sort of manageable, you know, if someone wanted to come read Disunion five years from now, we could tell them, we'll go read the 400, word, 400 articles that we've had, that we had up until mid, you know, 2013, or... And that raises an interesting <coughs> issue about the durability of things digital. Right, no, it does, turn. absolutely. Well, what percentage of what's been on the, on the web is in the book? So. Oh, uh, you know, no more than twenty percent, and by now, actually, it's probably down fifteen percent. So, but that, but the book is—it's not so much a greatest hits as as it is. Uh, but I'm in it, so suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody here is it's in the it, very so best. I, it's obvious. Uh, <laughs> but but really was to say, well, okay, what are we trying to do with this series, and let's pull out the themes that uh, that guide it and, and put that into the book. So, so. Clay responded with my next question for everybody. So what's the biggest challenge you face in the way that you present history to the public? Anybody can talk in any order of But somebody has to go first. Well, because I deal with slavery on a daily basis, particularly I'm in the weeds looking at the records, oftentimes it's difficult to pull out what's happening with women what's happening with the children and the families. The general public, when we hear the word slavery, we have this amorphous kind of idea of a mass of people. But when we look at what goes on with uh, families, with the separation of families, mothers and the children, we don't really have a sense of that. And I find that there were a few articles um, in this union that really brought that to the fore. One of them was the April 25th of article this year about rape and justice in the Civil War. That was really well done. And it gave you an insight into what was going on during the Civil War with the Lever Code of 1863. And this was um, one of the first times that black women were accorded uh, legal uh, protection under the law because for the first time um, white slave owners now realize that they could not protect their property. And that's how black people were thought of. Um, when black women were raped in the war, they could no longer have any recourse with the slave owners because now the, everyone was at wit's end because of the war. And so when we look at the experiences of women, I think the disunion of the world gives you an opportunity to look at it from a very personal perspective perspective, and also the ability to put it within the legal uh, arena. So the biggest challenge you faced in, in working on the, the NAMES project is actually sort of recovering the history of, of women and children, and you're finding that the blog will be of help. Right? Very much so. Is that it? I think one of the greatest challenges uh, we face is that uh, 
At Richmond National Battlefield Park, we cover pretty much the entire Civil War. And when many people go to Antietam or Gettysburg, it is pretty much one point in time that they are able to focus on. But when a visitor comes into our park, um, they may be interested in the 62 campaign or 64 campaign, or they may not know exactly what the story is. And then when they realize how detailed it is, how complicated it is, that we do cover such a vast period of time with so many different stories, um, from the Trenton Ironworks and the Industrial Story, Jim Barrazzo Medical Museum and the Medical Story, um, it can be a little daunting, I think, for them. And uh, to try and work with them to kind of uh, create their visitor experience and what they uh, like to take away from their, from their visit. Um, so it can be a little tricky. I'd say a lot of us here resent Gettysburg. Uh, since it's just uh, three days, we have to do that, right? And I mean, so surely there are compensatory uh, benefits to this. Mm -hmm. So we'll feel better about ourselves. Tell us what those might be. Well, one of the benefits, I think, is that it is such a rich story, um, a tremendous story of uh, the city of Richmond during the war, the battles and campaigns that have fought around. Um, one of the things maybe that people have heard of Gettysburg and Antietam, but for the seven days, they may not be as familiar. Or they know of the seven days, but they can't tell you what those individual battles are. Or maybe they heard of Malvern Hill, but they don't know what the seven days. Um, but when you take a look at the impact that that campaign and those battles had, and how it truly changed the course of the war following the setback the Union suffered in the seven days, you really can shed some light and you can see people, that spark of interest, that, wow, I didn't know that. And, um, Is it too late for us to rebrand that? Richmond presents the seven days. <laughs> Robert, how do you? I think it's writing material that clashes with memory, uh, existing memory of the war, especially as Southerners. Um, I know I, I put material out there, and usually it's in general, and sometimes I've had people specifically come back and say, there's no way my ancestor believed that, you know. And, and I had specifics where uh, I, I clearly defined a family who was a, a unionist family, and they said, "No, no, you're because uh, my ancestor served, and therefore he was a loyal Confederate." And uh, that that can be a challenge when you're when you're getting volatile feedback like that. <laughs> but <laughs> so you. In some ways, your closeness to actually naming names and, and right, and, right, and that, that I think that strikes the home a little bit more. It is not intended to strike home like that. It's it's to help show people that that the dynamic, the, the the southern population was more complex, more dynamic. It wasn't just a bunch of people who decided to go with the Confederacy to So let me ask you a hard question. I mean, is there, and it's going to go to claims. So people expect you know the New York Times to be you know. I've heard jokes today about being so liberal, and then, you know, so I made a joke about that. It's not a New York Times editorial. It's already made his mind beforehand, so forth. Uh, you know, so politics is pretty close to the surface of a lot of these things. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, do you come to this with a point, Robert, do you want to show things are complex, but are you trying, do you have a particular angle that you're? I, I, I think when I first started off the blog, I was confrontational. And uh, ultimately, I think, uh, I thought, well, that's great to, it seems to be confrontational draws numbers. But um, I don't know this the best, for me, it's the best brand of history to put out. I like, I like to be able to print, put the facts out and analyze them. And I think it's not so much the in-your-face approach that probably has, makes better strides toward helping people to understand the complexity. Not necessarily see the things my way. Right. But to be able to see, okay, I get now a little bit more. So that's attention, attracting an audience. Right. Uh, yeah, do you want to increase numbers? numbers? <laughs> and is it all about numbers or just about, look, I'm going to put out history and see how it goes. So, Clay, do you find that uh, people expect they're coming to the Times they're getting a version of what Barack Obama would have thought about the Civil War? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's hard to say. I think that we, uh, we actually have, partly because it's a, oh, website that you can go to directly. Uh, it's obviously branded as part of the New York Times and it is in the New York Times system. But it is something, we do have a lot of uh, people who come and only read the series, uh, who are, uh, I mean they don't wear it on their sleeves, but they are not the typical New York Times reader. 
Uh, and uh, we definitely have an audience that is a disunion audience uh, that doesn't necessarily fully overlap with, uh, with the New York Times readership. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think that was, or at the same time, I think that was one of the, one of the struggles, or one of the things that we decided to struggle with at the beginning was, you know, we're not, this is not a, uh, a presentist project, we're not trying to say something about what's going on today, we're not trying to draw lessons, uh, we reject pieces that do that, do that too much. Uh, you know, it's one thing to reflect a little bit, but we don't try to get people, we don't want people to win political points. And, uh, and we figured that, first of all, anyone who reads an article can draw their own conclusions and say what that means about the present. But we also realized that that would, that we needed to do that for, uh, for a, to draw the respect of readers. And, and it's funny, we, uh, every once in a while when someone does maybe sort of cross that line a little bit, we do have readers who will say, this is not what I want out of this series. I want history, pure and simple. And uh, so that's always something we're very mindful of. History, pure and simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> which is its own complexity. Well, okay. it's its own conversation, right? So, right. so where are the hot spots today? Uh, in our, what, what can you say that's guaranteed to get somebody disagreeing with you? Not to screw with whatever you say, just to show that. But you know, where are the hot spots? Ed, you're out there on the front lines all the time. I think. Um, Obviously, when you start getting into the causes of the Civil War, um, I think uh, in a lot of the work that's been done by academics and so forth, um, uh, you know, the root of slavery and uh, emancipation, um, maybe in uh, uh, not necessarily why all in the North fought, they may have been fighting for union and so forth, but that root cause. And um, many people will, will hold on to, well, states' rights and things that uh, you see that materialized after the war is uh, the two sides work to come together and uh, kind of put away the things that separated them and focus on the other. So, so are a lot of people actually, the, the things that we're at the anniversary of now are easier for you to interpret when everybody's identified with the blue or the gray and they're fighting and you're talking about a battle rather than the original moments of secession and so forth. And so, so it's still about what caused the Civil War that people are fighting about the most. How about interpreting, interpreting African American history or whatever else you want? Well, one of the things that I thought about um, when you asked about the hot spot is the blog that I read um, that ran November 11, 2011, was Freedom Enough. And uh, it told about Harriet Jacobs um, in Washington with the refugees. And the situation was dire. The people were destitute, they were sick and dying, um, the conditions were deplorable. And she said that uh, people looked up to her with tears in their eyes and they had that look that said, is this freedom? And when we ask ourselves now where we are, was the Civil War worth it? We could say yes, but for those who were just coming out of it, it was an extremely difficult time. Um, and when we look back 50 years from now, when we look back at 1963, we see the reasons why it was a civil rights movement. It makes you really wonder what could we have done differently to make freedom all that it should have been in 1865 or before. Um, the, the formerly enslaved people um, were free in some ways, but they did not have any power, they didn't have any sense of belonging. How could we have changed that at an earlier date? Those are the kinds of, of questions I ask myself as I'm reading these blogs. And so, in, in many ways, the blogs make you think about not only the past, but the present as well. Probably taking groups of Confederate soldiers and saying, looking at the anomalies and saying they weren't as dedicated as they thought they were. Um, especially when you, uh, one of the things I've looked, wanted to do is to take a close examination of the Stone Brigade and look at the soldiers from the valley who uh, who did not, who demonstrated they didn't really want to be there. Uh, they weren't just going home to take care of their crops and uh, 
They were often deserting and, and wanting to stay home. And when they came back, it wasn't on their own accord. It was often at the, at the end of the muzzle uh, when they came back to camps. So this, this can agitate uh, a lot of memory. Um, and they especially don't want to hear about the, about the larger groups, such as the silver group. <laughs> We call Stonewall. They must not have ever deserted her. They were they weren't they weren't your typical Worsham and, and the other name, the big names. It, it, did, it didn't ring through with all of them. So it sounds as if a lot of your danger comes when you personalize it. You're yes. not talking about aggregates, but yeah. talking about somebody's great. great and, and that's you know, and that's, that's another thing too. I think a lot of people are distanced. Uh, they they see uh, uh, one or two dimensional civil war when you're t when, when you're talking about bottom lines people. Uh, it's not just about a cause, it's also about people and their individual interests, and they, they vary greatly. So, do we see our audience is changing? Clay, I'd start with you. I mean, you know, do, do you, is it your feeling that uh, new people are being brought into conversation, or do you think it's people who've always been interested in this? I, I, think, I think yes. I think that um, one of the interesting things for me to see is the, the diversity of leadership. Uh, it's still, um, certainly the, we don't have information on everybody who comes to the site, but you get some sense, particularly through our Facebook page, uh, we can look at people who, some of their demographics, and you know, it certainly does skew toward the older male uh, demographic, but uh, there is a, a, there are a lot more younger people, a lot more uh, women and a lot more, as I said earlier, uh, people from around the country um, and people from around the world who are reading. And uh, I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's, it's partly because history is, is actually something that, despite what we tell ourselves sometimes, uh, that no one cares about history, it is actually something that a lot of people care about and, and want to engage with. But I also think that the Civil War continues to speak to something um, very much still relevant to us. It's not just something that made us who we are today, but it is uh, something that we can draw on in terms of contemporary debates and in terms of values, you know, and, and without being presentist about it, we can say, you know, what are, what, what is there about the Civil War that helps us better understand contemporary America? And this is, not to, not to go on, but is, it is, uh, very important, especially when America has changed so much, even from 50 years ago. I mean, the, the size of the immigrant population has, has changed us dramatically, and yet people still go back to that period. I think it's uh, it speaks a lot to who we are as a as a country that we continue to draw on this uh, singular event uh, to figure out who we are today. Do you have any sense of sort of self-identified ethnicity and race coming kind of this? I mean, no, and, and unfortunately, we really. We don't, and uh, I, I suppose at some point we can do a survey, but uh, but no, no. Speaking of restoring to the future, right. we would very much like to know these things. So I know, I, I know, it's, like uh, it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's something I wonder about occasionally. How about you folks? I mean, it, I wonder if the digital medium is attracting audiences that you would, that we wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, obviously you're going with the database for this reason, the, the National Park Service does some very innovative stuff, and obviously Robert's entire basis is online. Do we think that people are discovering things online who wouldn't discover it if it were somewhere else? Everybody's nodding? At least Ed and Robert are. I also think, also think that it, it, it gives um, people accessibility that they didn't normally have. Yeah. Um, for example, when, a, when an author writes a book, all right, they're going to see the person in a speaking engagement or whatever, but when you're real time, uh, you, you can get a comment and reply within a couple of minutes if you're online or if you're available. But uh, it's, it's quick feedback. And well, let's try some quick, uh, quick feedback right here. How many people here uh, well, read about the Civil War online? How many people here have absolutely no interest whatsoever in doing that? I don't know how to make a difference. And it's interesting. And I'd be curious to hear later on why you feel both ways. Uh, Ed, and uh, here's how the National Park Service is using this, and Lauren, how it's extended the reach of your work. I think it's a tremendous way to uh, reach new audiences, to reach uh, audiences that may not be able to visit the National Parks or the battlefields or whatever the site may be. Um, 
um, to give them a glimpse and um, a story and uh, give them a, a taste of what those uh, park sites are. Hopefully encouraging, sparking that interest, wanting, uh, encouraging to try and find out more. And uh, so there have been a lot of success with video podcasts and audio podcasts for the battlefields and things like that that you can use on the battlefield if you're there, but also if you're in California listening, you can still take something away. Do you have a sense of how many people have looked at things online before they come to the National Rally? I don't know that I do. Could um, you make up something? I'd love to say But we do have some people who say, uh, <coughs> say when you're in the visitor center, I listen to your um, audio podcast before, you know, something like that. So you do get that type of feedback, but as far as actual numbers, well, I would add that to the assignment that I gave Clay, okay? Yeah, we really need to know these things. Is that 50 years from now, we wonder about what was success with Centennial like. If these guys, if these are, you're breaking new ground. Learn that? Well, to tell you the truth, I had no interest in the Civil War. That's all the time we have for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you might remember, uh, at UVA, I studied the Reconstruction era. I wanted to stay as far away from slavery and war as I could. But because we are in Virginia, it is very difficult to get away from the sea. And because I was in a doctoral program and he was my advisor. <laughs> Yes, I said, you had an awesome experience. But I did have an awesome experience. And actually, that is what encouraged me to say, let me at least take a look at this. And when I started looking at it, and I said, let me look at it from the perspective that I want to know more about, which would be women and African Americans. And that's when the, the whole subject opened up for me. And I'm very fortunate in that what I do now, um, I'm able to really focus in on those areas and learn about um, the Civil War, not only uh, from those perspectives, but to put it in the larger context. And that really has helped me on a daily basis because really dealing with um, the primary sources uh, are, is difficult. I'm reading the stuff that's been written by slaveholders when they talk about children and the values that they place on children and selling people and moving them from place to place. That's very difficult to deal with on a daily basis. And when you realize what the Civil War was about, that carries me through. That is really what makes me understand this is why we had that civil war. So, have we learned anything during the sesquicentennial? Do, do, do we know things now that we didn't know four years ago from experiencing this? Yes. What would that do? <laughs> <laughs> we know that Virginia really was one of those pivotal places. More people died here than in any other place. Um, more battles were fought here than in any other place. And then when I take that forward into the civil rights movement, more battles, more legal battles were fought here than in any other place, and more legal battles were won. Um, and it makes you wonder, why is Virginia on the, the forefront of these great battles? Um, we believe very very deeply in things that are important to us. And that has really, I know it sounds hokey, but it really has made me appreciate being a Virginian. We believe very deeply. We will go to war for what we believe in. Um, and one of the things I've learned in studying this era is that Virginia was not at the forefront of succession. It took a while for us to come into uh, that, that whole arena. And even the, the counties in the western part of Virginia broke away um, and succeeded from Virginia. Um, and so we, we see the, the diverse opinions of Virginians during that difficult time, which is something I had not really known before. Ed? 
So you're an expert in this already. Have you discovered anything in the four years of the REIT fighting? Um, I think uh, the biggest thing I've noticed is um, the broadening of the stories that are being told. Um, where I think uh, earlier periods um, it was pretty much just the battlefields and, and um, the generals that may be looked at. Where now, um, yes, they are still covered, but you're also going to take a look at the impact on civilians and. What was it like for a family, maybe like the Shelton's, who were at rural plains and were caught in the middle of the fighting? What was it like uh, uh, for the people of Hanover County who had the armies there in 1862, um, somehow bring back their farms, bring back their lives, and then the armies come back in 1864 and you've got to do it all over again? Um, uh, taking a look at um, women's roles and uh, taking a look at African Americans, uh, both free and, and uh, slave, and their experiences, um, trying to tell a much bigger story, uh, what it was like for prisoners, uh, hospitals. Um, I think that's one of the things, and that uh, attendance has been good for all that, that people are interested in those stories. And, uh, that strikes me as a great parallel in what all four of you are doing. It turns out that you wouldn't keep doing this if people weren't interested in it. Sometimes people don't know they're interested in it until you tell them the story, which I think is one of the great gifts of the disunion blog, is that people, I just never thought of that, but here I am on the blog, and I'll go ahead and read it anyway. And I think it must open people. So it's interesting how all, all these stories are the same. Robert, has that been your experience as well? Um, I'm still watching the Sesquipedia. Like, uh, as an extension of the blog, I've been out to multiple Sesquipedia events, and uh, just to see how many people are showing up and how many people are participating. But also, while I'm not a numbers follower, I, I do watch spikes occur in the blog field uh, during specific events. Actually, my, my highest numbers, ironic enough, uh, my highest numbers came when I just put on the, uh, the webcam for Fort Sumter that day. I didn't say anything. That's all I did. And I had more hits that one day than the entire time I blogged. Why? It was simple. I guess, and people just were drawn to the, the key word. And it was especially hitting hard around uh, April 20th. That's, that's what they're looking for. Uh, same thing with Gettysburg uh, Post. Whenever anybody posted anybody at Gettysburg, it spiked. Uh, so there's really a common tension here is that, uh, and I'm curious if this is your experience, is that we know there's been a great broadening of the story and of the subjects, uh, but people do still seem to be drawn to the battles. Uh, how do you yeah, I think that's I think that's true. I think one of the things that the sesquicentennial has allowed us to do is to take a lot of if you think about the way that history is done, particularly in the academy, but I think generally speaking too, you have people who hit particular kind you hit you have the battlefield historians and you have the cultural historians and the women's historians and they tend not to talk to each other. Uh, and uh, their audiences tend not to talk to each other. And one thing the sesquicentennial allows us to do is to impose a, a crude but very effective structure on all that and say, look, there's a chronology, and it starts with November 4th, 2010, or you know, 1860, and it goes up until Appomattox, or whenever you want to end it. And with that kind of chronological scaffolding, we can start to address all of these different things in, uh, you know, in proximity. We can put individual stories, so, you know, we want to focus on a micro history of one family. When you look at that experience and see how it relates to a bigger story about a campaign, and you can say, you, here's one slave's experience of escaping, and, and it, was, it was taking place at the same time as another battle, and it allows people who might not have focused on one or the other to start to even inadvertently say, oh, well, there's this other story that was going on at the same time. That's fascinating. And then they get into that part and eventually understand that, oh, it's all really the same story. It's all really the same history. It's not women's history over here and, and African-American or slave history over here and the battlefields over here. It's, it's all part of the same thing. And, and this is also where the web is useful because it's such an expansive tool that you know, it's it's not one book and it's not a bookshelf. It's it's all of it's much bigger than that. So one person can access a huge amount of information and see it organized and to some extent organize it themselves, and uh, and really have a, a, an immersive experience that they might not have been able to have even as you said, you know, five or ten years ago. 
So your experience online is not like Richland's experience. We have the whole thing here, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and part of the challenge is finding interpretive threads that tile it together. Is Absolutely. It does start me speaking as the, the academic up here that we're kind of getting over some of this. You're exactly right. The war in camps. I'm not interested in military history. I'm not interested in women's history. Whatever. We're kind of getting over that. Uh, yeah. and because people realize, first of all, it's kind of productive and silly, and B, it's all part of the same story. But it does strike me that, and while I'm talking, let me ask you this. Uh, reading the book, this is kind of a shameless plug, to be clear, I get nothing from it. Uh, it's not common for academics to write history in 1,000 word hunks. Uh, and, you know, I was a little appalled as somebody who's written longer things to see that a thousand words were often enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's actually, it's been when, when I talk to you know, the sort of hardcore you know, chair professors and uh, chairs of academic departments and people who have big stacks of books underneath them, uh, it's uh, one of the reasons why they like writing for us is the challenge of, that they find in taking part of or even a whole book that they've written and, and distilling it down to a particular story or a particular point. And, uh, and that's not all of this. <laughs> Every once in a while, one will say, I never want to do that ever again. But for the most part, uh, they come to it uh, again and again because they like that. The other thing that they like, and, and one of the underlying goals of, of the series uh, was, uh, to get, was to provide a bridge between uh, academics and non-academics, both on the writing side, but also uh, between academic and non-academic readerships, and you know, to to provide a to open a door from the ivory tower to get people out there talking. And and again, one of the things that a lot of our academic writers like about that experience is that they have to defend themselves and engage with readers who actually know a lot more than they. Or bring interesting perspectives that were never brought to them at a conference, you know, full of other academics, but are uh, fully valid points of view that they just never thought of. I do think this is a watershed uh, in which it's, I can't think of the time that academic life is intersected with American public life. Uh, in sustained way. I think that's, and that's the other thing, is the sustained element of it, and that it just keeps going on and on. Yeah, and speaking of sustained, I'm sure the feeling that I think maybe everybody at this table has felt, it's only 1863, and I'm so tired of all the and, 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 you know, so, you know, sort of the excitement of secession winter, <laughs> then the, the first battles, and, but now it's Mike Gorman uh, of the Park Service had a great quote this He's not here, is he? Uh, but he said uh, people tend to think that everything before Gettysburg was, let's see, it was a good quote, but he had it. <laughs> the part I want to use is that every, everything before Gettysburg was irrelevant, everything after Gettysburg was inevitable, right? And so now that Gettysburg hadn't passed, you know, uh, do you think that people are still going to be interested in 1864 and 1865 when it seems that the cast, the iron's being cast? Well, it's funny because you say that, and, and there was just a flurry of discussion just recently at Gettysburg uh, about uh, is now the sesquicentennial irrelevant after this point because there's uh, you, you won't get all the no, just in case anybody's wondering. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was my argument too. Some people were saying it's dead, it's done because you're not going to see the same feed, you're not going to see the same interest. Um, uh, it's it's a bloody drawn out fight now from from Gettysburg through Appomattox, and nobody wants to pay attention to that as much. It, I, and I, I disagree, but that's that's what some people were saying. Well, I would say I would say the uh, what's interesting for me and what uh, as a former political journalist is, uh, you know, I think the 1864 election is is a fascinating story and, and is something that is not often understood within that kind of to the, the narrow Civil War history. People just don't, they knew it happened, and of course they know the story of you know, Atlanta saved Lincoln and all this, but you know, the details of the McClellan campaign and the details of uh, just Democratic and how close it politics was. and how close it was and, and how the war intersected with politics, particularly now we are in this 
in 2013, we are in kind of a renaissance of uh, political, you know, maybe not always good political conversation, but I think a lot of the country is very much engaged in political conversation, uh, more than they used to be. And so this is a, I think there will be a lot of that crossover, people saying, oh, this is how Lincoln ran for re-election. This is what politics back then was like. So I think there will be that. Um, but I think also, look, I mean, yeah, there are going to be people who turn off because Gettysburg is over. But uh, at the same time, there is there is so much rich storytelling to be done. And of course, you begin to see the setup for the post-war and what happened after the war. And so much of that, I think, yeah, a lot of it's in the telling and you have to engage people. But I think that there is a there is naturally interesting stuff out there. So you're going to take this day. Don't, don't even. <laughs> <laughs> no, we get that question a lot, but uh, no, we will figure out a time sometime in 20, mid-2015 when this will wrap up. Uh, but, yeah, it won't be right on mathematics or just to avoid questions like this, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got our big year coming up, right? I mean, if you're going to think about when Richmond's really, the, once again, the center of attention, mm -hmm. uh, have special strategies in place? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, we've been uh, working on our programming and uh, the different stories we want to tell. And yes, we think that there will be an audience uh, uh, still interested in, in uh, the battlefields and those other stories. Um, I think Lincoln one point said, on the success of our arms, all else chiefly depends. And that was very true in 64 because uh, uh, he realized that it was an election year and how what happened on the battlefield could impact things politically, diplomatically, uh, on the home fronts, morale-wise. Um, and so it would be an absolutely critical year of the war. And at one point it gets so bad that he, he's not sure he's going to be reelected. Yeah, the only thing that happened the war happened here in Richmond. He might not have been, right? Given the course of what had happened then, right? Yeah, I mean, it is a, it's an amazing time. So we are looking at uh, programming. We're fortunate to have gone through it already with the 1862 campaign. So we now have some experience of what it's going to be be like, um, but it should be a very exciting time to re-examine stories. Um, one of the things that I think will keep people interested is the ways that we can bring in public history, particularly through material culture. Uh, earlier this month, there was a blog on Carte de Visites, the early photographs um, that were taken. And we would find those Carte de Visites on the bodies of the soldiers, they would be on the dressers of, of women at home. And those were the kinds of things that kept um, people together when they were apart. And these are the things, even in our own lives now with photographs, that keep families and communities together. And so as we look at material culture, there's a way to look at the past and what that past can teach us. Um, currently at the Virginia Historical Society, we have an exhibit called Revolutions, Songs of Social Change. And we are looking at the periods 1860 to 65 and 1960-65. We've included carte de visite in that exhibit, which gives you an opportunity to look at, for example, the Richmond Graves, and also to look at uh, women like Lizzie Alsop, who was a 16-year-old in Fredericksburg who lived so close to the war that she could hear it outside of her window. Those kinds of material culture gives us an opportunity to really touch history in a different kind of way. So yes, I do think that the interest will last. Well, let's see if it lasts for the next half hour, when, as I promised or threatened, uh, we're going to have questions and answers. So who'd like to begin with a question for anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, I've often heard historians, including President Ayers, say that during the sesquicentennial we need to develop a better understanding of how it was black people themselves, unprompted by abolitionists or white politicians or generals, who pressed President Lincoln and history itself towards emancipation. Is the sesquicentennial doing that about our understanding, and how will this question be answered 50 years from now? Uh, and that's certainly something that we've, uh, a story that we've tried to unpack with, uh, with the series and showing the dynamics of all the different interest groups, but, you know, whether it's uh, abolitionists in Congress, uh, black abolitionists in the North, uh, the, uh, the, the movement of 
escaped and freed slaves from the South, how this all changed the political calculus in the White House and the decision to move to emancipation and, and uh, to create USCT units and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's certainly something that, that we've tried to do, and I think uh, looking at the scholarship that's out there from young uh, uh, researchers and the, the response to these articles, I think that that is part of the narrative, certainly something that was not there 50 years ago, uh, and, and I think is not settled in any way. Uh, so I think that 50 years from now, there probably will be a much different story. I think uh, that uh, we're only sort of now kind of understanding a little bit better how dynamic that issue was. That it wasn't simply something that Lincoln decided, and it wasn't something that was decided from the beginning. Uh, rather, it was uh, a question that was answered as different interest groups came in, came into uh, the fore. So, even though uh, a book that won a big prize in the last year or two, uh, James Oakes' yeah. book, uh, sort of argues to the contrary. It's sort of like post uh, the discovery. It says no, the Republicans knew from the beginning yeah. what they were going to do. And it pretty much unfolded. It was painful, and they had to, to struggle over it. But they, starting with the Confiscation Acts early on in the war, that it, it enacted. It doesn't intentionally, obviously, you know, marginalize African Americans, but it does say if you want to see what really drove emancipation, that it was already in the minds of Abraham Lincoln and the radical Republicans from the beginning. So it's interesting. It's not just like, okay, now we figured that out. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Some of this is reassertion. I think, too, um, when we consider places like Fort Monroe, where there were three men who came um, seeking uh, sanctuary, Baker, Shepherd, and Townsend, that gives you a different perspective than the one that we have always thought of, where blacks have been waiting for uh, someone to come. Wait, three whole weeks, right? <laughs> yeah. they, they were there. And then, quickly, after that, you started seeing the exodus from the plantations, not only of men, but women and children as well. And so, um, in places like Fort Monroe um, and uh, plantations like Berkeley, for example, I was working with a document um, written by the slave owner of Berkeley who talks about the 62 people who left when the Union Army was near. And in that document, he names all of those enslaved people, which includes children as well. Um, and so this gives you a, a better understanding that these were people who were not uh, waiting, uh, passively waiting, but actively taking a stand and moving forward with their lives. And Robert, do you understand that? The, the only thing I'm going to say is the with the valley. Um, looking at USCTs that, that developed from that area, uh, some of them had already left. Uh, and I'm seeing uh, enlistment patterns in Ohio and uh, throughout the North, but then of course you got those people who appear to be, and this is something that's difficult to figure out, is, is who, who was actually a slave, who was actually free Um But there, there are some of those that actually escaped across the line into West Virginia and listed with, with one units out that way. But it's, it's, that's a difficult thing to trace. I think particularly as we get into 1864 and uh, we look at some of the operations uh, outside Richmond and particularly at the fighting at uh, Fort Harrison and Newmarket Heights and the role of um, uh, United States Colored Troops, USCT regiments uh, and the 14 African Americans who earned the Medal of Honor in that action and one of them being Powhatan Beatty who's from the area. Um, I think that would be a tremendous opportunity to be able to talk about um, the role that played escaping, joining the Union Army, and... Uh, and it's hard to exaggerate the difference between this and the centennial. You know, when uh, Richmond thought about that and, and had to build a, a museum about it, and it, there was no mention of any of these things, you know. So it'd be very interesting to think about 50 years, you know. Uh, I'd like to think that we've pretty much reached the pinnacle of historical understanding, but I guess they're going to keep writing books and stuff. And <laughs> and things, you know. Great question. What else we got? Yes, sir. And there's some microphones are coming, so here's your chance. Um, it strikes me that, that history is not something that's frozen. And each time we have one of these commemorations, it impacts and changes who we are in the present, whether that was in 1910 or 1960, and the events going on. 
or even now in 2013. How do you see us changing now? What kind of things happened in 1910 and 1960 that might give us some kind of trailer as to what to expect as we move through the next three years? That's very interesting. I, I'll, I'll start briefly. You know, obviously, uh, a little bit of quick math reminds us that the centennial of the Civil War was also the high point of the civil rights struggle. And so, at the very same time that people are, that the, you know, the, the National Commissions and the Virginia Commission tell the story of the Civil War as white man versus white man, uh, there was another kind of profound struggle growing on, which actually drained a lot of the sense of um, excitement and engagement with the centennial because people were watching television and seeing Birmingham and exactly 150 years ago the next week, uh, the March on Washington. And so then you saw a lot of energy and attention early in the centennial and it, and it faded off pretty seriously by the time you got to Appomattox. So from the past, you, you saw it was kind of hijacked, uh, overtaken by current events that were an interesting echo of things that had happened 100 years before. What do you folks think about this good question? Um, I mean, one thing that we, I would think that we'll probably see more of is an understanding of where the war fit within uh, a global context. Uh, that's certainly something that's happening a little less so in, the, in maybe the public <coughs> approach to uh, the sesquicentennial, but certainly in the academic world, as you see a lot more people saying, well, you know, what did the Civil War mean to uh, politics in Europe? Uh, we forget that at the time, uh, there was much, this wasn't the only Civil War going on. In fact, the Chinese Civil War was uh, a much bigger deal, uh, certainly for Chinese. Um, but even for Europe, Europe was looking at two Civil Wars, and, and they had a lot of investments in China, and, and how did that fit into, say, Britain's decision to intervene or not intervene, right? The events in those two places. Uh, what did uh, Bismarck, for example, was uh, greatly inspired by the American Civil War and by Lincoln's success with the war, and saw Lincoln as a model for his own way of looking at centralizing control over a pretty diverse, large, country, uh, or in his case, it was an empire. Uh, so I think, I think people will be looking at this a lot more in the future, and I don't mean that it won't be an American experience 50 years from now, but I think that it will be understood to have been a global experience in a very significant way, in the way that we haven't seen it in the past. Other thoughts? One of the things I've seen, and uh, I don't think a lot of people appreciate too, is the, the, the global experience uh, the global involvement in the American war, the uh, people uh, down at the bottom level, uh, the, the Hungarians, Czechoslovakians who were in the ranks, uh, Italians, you, you've got a, a strange, broad mix there. It's Chinese who were in the ranks. Um, I think Ted Alexander up at uh, uh, Antietam is putting put together a book for the National Park Service, I think he mentioned not too long ago, in the, in the coming year or so. So that's going to give us a Chinese civil war. Chinese and civil war. Yeah. Ed, Barnett, do you think the same this? Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is um, a blog that was written, A Mother's Letter to Lincoln by Terrell Hunter um, earlier this month, August 1st, as a matter of fact. I hope you take a look at that. And uh, she is a, a black mother, literate, um, and her son is in the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. Um, and she asked Lincoln to step up and do what is right um, because the soldiers were not being paid equal. And when we think about what was going on then in the inequality and the pay and the, the, the conditions under which they uh, were fighting and living, um, and look at what's happening since then in 1910, 1960, now even, it makes you really think about how far we still have to go. Um, toward equality, not only in pay, but in so many other things, housing, education. Um, and I really think um, that kind of blog gives us the opportunity to reflect not only on the past, but where we're going. I think one thing you'll see more generally is that there's not really a euphoric tone the way there was back in 1960, one, two, three, a sense of celebration of the Civil War. Um, 
if you go to the Valentine and look at the pictures they have of the uh, building here, which was only torn down a few years ago for the centennial, uh, outside they have a Mercury space capsule. <laughs> you know, so what the Civil War was really about is that creation of a nation that could hold its own against the Russians and that could win, <laughs> and they could win World War II. So it was a strong celebration. And you could say, well, it's kind of too bad that we're not prouder of what the Civil War won. Now, I think we're so struck by the loss, the personal loss, as well as the incompleteness of the of emancipation. I think that it's a kind of somber, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't hear what Ed says, but I'm curious if that's your sense I think from, from your Yeah, I think complicated in a way that, uh, yeah, doesn't give a lot of opportunity. One of the things, one of the conversations that does happen is, is that it's the same thing that Lorinette raises is the, the question of was the Civil War worth it? And, you know, in some ways I think that that can be, that's both, can be a very profound question and can be a very, uh, a, uh, a misguided question, right? Because of course the Civil War, no one decided, okay, we're gonna, should we have a war, should we not have a war? It, it's something that happened. And, uh, but at the same time, I think that is something that we struggle with today uh, as we look back and say, uh, you know, was this, I think it's, it's a profound question in the sense that is it something that uh, you, know, you can look and say, well, it was, uh, it, it failed in its achievement, or it, it failed in, uh, in its promise, right? Emancipation happened, but it was such, such a narrow sense of emancipation. It was not uh, freedom in any real substantive way, and it took 100 years to reach that. Uh, and I think that's some, that's the kind of thing that people today are struggling with and, and when they think about the Civil War. And, and of course the question of, you know, if that is the result of it, well, 800,000 people died, that we, you know, strictly speaking, was that, was that worth it? Uh, so I think that's the kind of question that's being debated now that is so very different from, uh, from that celebratory attitude that you raised. Is it your sense that the wars in which we've been engaged the last decade have since I've been here curious I think that's feeling about that. Do you kind of, you have a sense that we're less enamored of, of war? I think, I think, I think so, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that has been interesting to see, uh, uh, there are a number of scholars out there and, and working on this question of PTSD in the Civil War. Of course, Drew Faust's book, uh, The Republic of Suffering, really opened the question, but a number of other people have been working on this particular question, this particular issue. The PTSD as an idea didn't exist back then. Of course, people had it. Uh, we are still human beings in the 1860s. And uh, so there's been a lot of, and I don't think that we would have that level of attention if it weren't for the experiences that we've had as a nation, as a world, over the last 10 years uh, with the focus on what does war do to somebody. Uh, that, I think, is, is, uh, is, a, is another question that is being applied to the war and is very unique to the moment. Um, I think uh, the people who do come to the parks and so forth uh, yes, uh, don't, uh, you know, celebrate the war. They're they're there to understand um, the battles, uh, the impact, uh, why it mattered, um, how it affects our country's history. Um, so I don't necessarily see it as that like, uh, celebration or uh, that it may have been at one point. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think we should be reminded that um, historians, public historians, museums, and the like uh, had a great deal of difficulty with celebration in in terms of the Columbian discovery and. So the, the change between the 100th anniversary and, and the 150th has a lot of other stuff that's unrelated to the, to the Civil War, but it has a lot to do with uh, uh, the greater perspective that we bring to the fact that, you know, there's winners and losers in these, in these cataclysmic historical events. And um, celebration is a word that pretty much got crossed off in, in in the early 90s as as uh, as applicable to these kinds of uh, these kinds of commemorations and what, what would you know about this <laughs> just a little bit. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and can you summarize the question 
Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, the, well, yeah. You want to just repeat your question? Yeah. It was really a comment. Yeah. And, and the, the comment was that um, Ed was contrasting uh, the 100th anniversary with the mood of the 150th anniversary of the uh, of, of the Civil War, and, and, and my point was simply that um, when we were approaching. Um, the anniversary, the big anniversary of Columbus, um, historians, public historians, museums and the like, suddenly got themselves into one heck of an argument uh, over whether or not that was the kind of event that could be celebrated. Because there were obviously, um, you know, this was not a cool thing if you were a Native American tribe in the Caribbean. Um, and so the, the, the moral um, arguments that took place um, in, inside the public history and museum community um, in the early 90s. I, it seems to me informs the situation that we're in, um, in, in addition to um, you know, the, the differences between 1960 and, 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 and today. Yes, in the back. Okay, let's go to the microphone. Okay, sure. I came of uh, age in the early 1960s, and, and the centennial of the Civil War was sort of my first introduction to it. The thing that fascinates me about it is the change in your profession over the last 50 years. I mean, the, the records that you go through to, to give us the names of the enslaved people weren't created in the last 50 years. You, they, they were there, and you're, you're now just discovering them. So I really would appreciate the comments you got about the craft of history. Um, your profession, the changes that take place over the last 50, and what might take place over the next 50 years? It's a great question. Who wants to answer it? I would answer it at the risk of asking you to um, uh, focus on your own work. I think some of the work that you've done at the University of Richmond and that you personally had it done, uh, just in terms of digital scholarship, uh, these things, the insights that you get from some of these uh, databases, uh, or collections of material simply were not available without the computing power and, and the insights of, of historians like yourself. And that's really just, thank you, uh, a little extra something for you. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, my microphone doesn't seem to be working, but I'll just be loud. Uh, or I'll borrow, borrow Lauren Hetz, which has also gone off now that she's handed it to me. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> We just be we just begun. I think it's one of the things that's so exciting to me. One reason I was eager to participate in this. I do believe disunion will be looked back upon as a turning point in the way that we do history. Uh, I think something else, and John's point is that we're all historians here. That the, the, the profession itself has broadened, so there's no sense that somebody owns it and other somebody else is an interloper. Uh, the fact that people on the front lines, people at the National Park Service know more about history than academics can really imagine um, and have to test it with every conversation. So I think there's been a broadening in the subject and so that we're actually looking then, I don't think it's not the machinery that drives it, it was the questions that drove it, right? And so that we, and then it's a, a process by which you say, wow, you could actually see the names of the enslaved people and search them and sort of speed genealogy. And then people, the visionaries at the New York Times say, boy, we could actually speed the conversation about it. So in the old days, as when I wrote uh, my earlier books, you'd write them and then maybe a year later they'd be reviewed and then maybe a year later they'd go into paperback and then maybe somebody would sign into a class and it was like just molasses rocking, you know? So now you've got, you, you publish something in the New York Times, and that afternoon, you already have five people telling you how stupid you are. It's a wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> but but the, the, the sense of a, a broader audience, uh, I think, is what's so exciting. I think it also makes us better historians. If you think that you have to explain yourself to everybody, and not just a few other people who have to go to the same graduate school you did, I think it makes it a different kind of history. Yeah. Oh, I think so. And it's, uh, in, you know, in some ways it's, in, in, very sub in very important ways, it's not, it's not about dumbing down. In fact, it's, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, sort of baggage and, and 
not worthless, but you know, there's certain ways that academics talk to each other, which is their own lingo. Not which, completely uh, worthless, I like that. Not completely <laughs> worthless, but, but that, that, uh, that fall apart when you have to start to think about, well, what does this really mean to someone outside of it? And, uh, and I think really, really, to go back to my previous point, really does help shape that, uh, the arguments and the evidence, the use of evidence that, uh, that a historian is, is undertaking. I do believe that we have an obligation to reinvent history that will take advantage of what we can do. One of the things that Clay's referring to is uh, a colleague of mine plotted everywhere that the United States Army came in contact with African Americans throughout the entire war. We could not have done that just two years ago. And, and watch it in a map that moves, that's an amazing thing. So it's thrilling to think that we're at the beginning of a really new democratization, both an audience, but also an understanding. I saw another hand over here. Yes, wait. And that does mean wait, that's his name. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been interesting listening to this. Uh, uh, you can yourself, you know. I'm, I'm the uh, director of the Museum of the Confederacy. Uh, it's been interesting watching a, a, a reflective discussion bring a lot of perspective on the uh, Civil War. But I, the, um, it's interesting to me also that not only are we uh, interpreting history, but we're making history uh, as we go through the sesquicentennial. And it's, it's inordinately easy for us to look back and talk about the things that were done right or wrong in the past, uh, particularly with the centennial. I'd like to Turn the question. Say, uh, when the panel is sitting up there 50 years from now, what will they uh, be saying that it was so obvious that we were doing wrong this time? <laughs> or did have we achieved perfection? <laughs> Nobody's going to answer this? Yeah, the only thing that came to my mind was, was uh, and some of the bloggers have talked about this, it's like, what did you do during the Sesquicentennial? What did you do to, do to, to contribute? What did you do to participate? And uh, uh, that, that's a big driving factor. It, it, if you didn't participate and didn't come out to these events, what did you do? What, what, you know, did you see what happened? Did you see a difference in what happened? Did you help make a difference in some way? And that includes in blogging. So, I think it's still an evolutionary thing. It's, we're still trying to figure out what to make better. I think I would like to see more ethnic and cultural diversity. Um, as you see here. <laughs> <laughs> Your point? <laughs> making progress. <laughs> do better. And I don't think it should take 50 years to do that. No, I, I, I would just second that and say that I think when uh, when you're in the moment, it's very easy to say we're uh, pretty close to perfection. But, uh, but yeah, I think 50 years from now, we'll look back and say we did, didn't quite yet even understand how uh, how much more we, how much further we had to go in terms of understanding the, the, the truly ethnic diversity. Yeah, we're, we're full of self-congratulations. Yes. We discovered there were other people living there. Yeah. yeah. I do think that they'll look back and say, the United States didn't even have a national commission on this, that the United States didn't even really acknowledge the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. I think that people will fit, see this as, um, a kind of a failure of imagination on the part of the country as a whole. We'll think Richmond, Virginia is freaking awesome, but uh, <laughs> because we really stepped up, but as in many ways we kind of ducked it. I think partly because we're not fully there yet, and it is kind of politically charged sometimes. Uh, it, it, it's ironic, of course, we have a first African American president, and that we don't really have a national conversation about this, except, frankly, in the New York Times. It's as close as we come to, to having that. I think. It's a question over here. I was just going to point out what you already pointed out, that this audience is going to be different next in, in 50 years, it's going to be a different audience and a different panel, which is, which is important and more diverse. Um, I'll echo you and affirm. 
Yes. I'm just like to, I'm just going to take advantage of the fact that I just have a microphone in my hand. <laughs> um, you used a term earlier, uh, the gentleman before, Mr. Rawls, had a question, and you used the term democratization of history. Mm -hmm. And I would like to pose to the panel the idea of, um, with the invitation, the invention of the internet, and um, every man being a researcher and every man being a source, where then do we put the limit um, of academic integrity? Where's the, where's the filter on who's making something up and putting it out there, and who can base their research on facts? Uh, I'll start. It's a great question. If I hear that? No. Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, now that we have uh, everything in, in this electronic context, where is, what's the guarantee that it's true? Where's the academic integrity on it? There's just a few footnotes uh, uh, and some references after the, the entries on this union blog. So you have a switch from one kind of authority, which is documenting every single fact that's in it in a way that you can trace it back. And that is really what scholarship is. That's what distinguishes academic work from non-academic work. It's accountable down to every single part of it. And that's extraordinarily valuable. We're replacing that with immediate fact checking by an audience of hundreds of thousands at least who are on the lookout for it. Now ultimately, however, is it the last person who writes a comment as the last word, right? Uh, and so, I, obviously, I don't think that my profession is worthless, I believe is the phrase, um, that uh, there, there's always going to be a need for what scholarship is, which is a, con a conversation that continues across generations that's accountable and recreatable. I think that the Disunion blog is doing what it intends to do and builds the bridge to the academic world but it is not yet digital scholarship. That's what's most exciting to me, and maybe the question, you know, to the question of what's going to come. Will we have books in 50 years? And if we don't, and we'll look back at a Kindle, well, that's pathetic. A picture of a page, when you could do so much more with all the things that text could be. So I think that I, if we're not careful, we could replace authority with opinion. And, but, on the other hand, I think it's good for those of us who assume authority have to have it challenged uh, in the public arena. John, have you thought of You know, I think it's funny you see this in journalism a lot, and in some ways history in journalism, or history as a profession and journalism as a profession have uh, similar challenges. Uh, you, you, know, you can say anybody can be a journalist, anybody can be a historian, but of course there are people who do history in a rigorous way that is Pretty, pretty tough to learn to do and, and do on a regular basis. And the same thing with journalism. And I think that uh, the fact that, at least so far, <laughs> journalism hasn't been killed off completely, certainly been challenged, but has not been killed off by, uh, by blogs or by the web. Uh, I think the same thing will bode for history of the profession. In the end, they're going to be better because of these things. Uh, historians will have to engage with the public in a way that they didn't in the past. Uh, and the public will be able to do history in a way that it didn't in the past. But that's going to make them, make both of them better at understanding their takes on history. And, you know, in the end, look, there are people who get paid to sit down and write long books about history. And, and someone who, uh, and some other, no, no, and I mean that as a, as a that's a very good thing. And those people will continue to exist, and those books are going to continue to be valuable because blogs and and series like what we do can do certain things, but they cannot provide that kind of sustained level of scholarship and insight that a book can. Now, will that be a physical book, or will it be a an ebook or uh, an enriched ebook experience? Who knows? But in the end, it's going to be the same drawing on the same DNA that books 50 years ago did. And so I think that this, I, I look at this as uh, yeah, certainly a challenge in sort of the, the, the short term, but really as, as something that in the long term we're going to look back and say, thank God this came along. And, and we're going to look back and say this really was a golden age of both public history and of, of hardcore scholarship, and everyone will benefit from it. That sounded very much like an eloquent conclusion in the same thirty. So I want to thank everybody for coming and doing their part to the assessment's opinion. When you're asked what did you do, you'll say I was there at the, the birth of the digital 
blogging and uh, the, the broadening, the democratization of past. So thank all of you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>